So I'd now like to introduce our panel, and uh, before I open it up for some questions, on my starting closest to me, we have Alison Wedgwood, who is a director of the African Water Enterprises, is a water economist by training and a part-time politician. And then we have, uh, next to her, we have, known to us all, Richard Carter, hugely experienced, uh, trained many people uh, through Cranfield University, many water, water specialists throughout the world, and as he explained to us earlier on today, he's extremely tall because he has his feet in the mud and his head in the clouds. <laughs> so that's very good. Uh, next we have Kim Morton, who is Director of KL um, consultancy based in Johannesburg, with a PhD in Imperial College and MBA from there too. And she's got decades of experience in working in sub Saharan Africa and is also a trustee of Hydrogeologists Without Borders. Next to Kim, we have Emmanuel Epong, who, as he explained to us earlier on today, is the regional director for WASH for World Vision. Uh, and has been doing a lot of work there and before that in Ghana and as he explained to me before his roots are really in the village and his heart's in the village too. And last but certainly not least is our born again hydrogeologist <laughs> Nick Byrne who's come through many uh, several institutes including water aid and practical action and is now in water for all. Well, I realised it was not completely born again hydrogeologist. He managed to have a great argument with uh, Jeff Davis in our workshop, which was good, good to see that he's still able to have a good argument about hydrogeology. <laughs> so we've got a, a great diverse panel today, and uh, we, we had several questions that were handed in to be put to them. I've kind of grouped them into four or five different questions, which I'll, I'll offer to the panel and uh, see if they can give us some pretty succinct answers would be good. The fir first one I would uh, probably like to put to uh, Richard, which is uh, how much hydrogeological expertise is required to site or drill a borehole? <laughs> how tall is a hydrogeologist? <laughs> how much hydrogeological expertise to site a borehole? Um, I think that depends a huge amount on the nature of the hydrogeology. Um, as you know, Alan, there are, there's a range of hydrogeology from um, that which that where you, you really don't need much in the way of sighting at all because groundwater is, is universal, um, through the, the kind of basement uh, complex hydrogeology where you need a, some fairly well established techniques um, for, for sighting and, and once you understand those it's, it's not rocket science. Um, but then there are situations where the hydrogeology is, is very complex and locally variable um, and a great deal of hydrogeological understanding is needed. And I, I guess the key thing is being able to distinguish one from the other. Um, and to know when you really do need that hydrogeological input. Thank you. Uh, Epong, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, from my own experience, I think just to emphasize the same point, uh, you need a trained hydrogeologist, and we, we did not sacrifice with that when we started the work. Uh, not just any other hydrogeologist needs to be properly trained who knows he, his or her job very well. And, uh, uh, and in terms of numbers, that would be difficult to say two or three people. It depends on the, on the terrain. But what we did for every well, every drilling equipment, we had drilling equipment of four. For every drilling equipment, we had a hydrogeologist and assistant hydrogeologist. We did a sighting and also monitored the well drilling process and also captured all the data to make sure, and then followed up also to make sure that the water quality and those issues were done. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Any, any comments or other further questions on that kind of topic from the, from the floor? Uh, Peter? Okay. <laughs> I think 
think the point is, and really touch on it at the end of this speech, it's about knowing when you knowing when you when knowing when you need help. And you can work with an extended team if you have sort of one trained hydrogeologist can work with a team of people who are <coughs> trained to carry out something mechanically. But if you look at the whole sort of Indo-Gangetic plains, this is where I developed a, a discipline called groundwater engineering that's sort of almost is unknown to some people except in construction work. And yet it worked up to a point. Millions of wells were installed in that way. But most of the people doing that were unable to anticipate the unexpected. And when they were faced, to take the example of the arsenic suddenly came up, people without that training had no idea how to respond. But Richard's point there is, I think, you can extend the group. and You don't need, you don't need to have a hydrogeologist doing every task on every site, because there aren't enough to go around. And I think, but but you have, if you don't have that input, you may end up in very big trouble. At that level of field supervision, it must go part of the way to explain his improved success in, in that front. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just wanted to make a point that in order to be able to decide whether you need a hydrogeologist on board or not, you, you need a level of hydrogeological understanding yourself in the first place. It's a catch-22, but um, one of the things I think is, is quite crucial is that in order for people on the ground in installing walls, if they are to solicit the, the, the work of a hydrogeologist, that they have enough knowledge themselves to ensure that the work is of sufficient quality and, and to be able to sort of, you know, assess that themselves. So, yeah. a, a degree of capacity building is definitely... So, I, th so I think something we're, we're seeing here is that there needs to be... So I, th so I think something we're, we're seeing here is that there needs to be groundwater knowledge at different levels throughout the whole sector. So there's people needs to be an influence at a high enough level in commissioning programmes or looking at projects so that they can assess what level of expertise is required as we go down the level. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on because I'd set that limit at quarter past five. To our next sort of area to look at, and Alison, this is this is for you. Uh, it's our money, isn't it? <laughs> it will be. <laughs> are groundwater sources affordable in the long term? And if so, who pays for them? <coughs> Um, right, I think the politicians answer and say no and yes. Um, I think it's always really no, I think it's more the truth because we have a system at the moment that isn't sustainable because the evidence is there, isn't it, in Africa? The half the bore holes and the hand pumps are broken, and no one's, um, and as we discussed, no one's repaired them. And one of the main reasons is because. There's no money, there's no spare parts, and etc. So I think, I think um, it's it's a really difficult <coughs> problem. Just basic economics said if the cost of the repairs exceeds the ability of either the community or the local government or the NGO who probably left anyway to pay them, then it's not sustainable, is it? It's not going to work. It's just it's just basic economics. Just be really depressing. And also, the actual capital costs are quite great. So the average borehole costs, as you guys know, quite, can be quite a lot of money, um, and so the, the, especially in rural communities where there is not the huge economies of scale, it's quite, we had a big chat at lunch, Richard and I, it's really quite difficult to see a way forward. Africa Water Enterprises, we are, we're, we're experimenting with users paying 50 pence a month per compound to a village water person, um, but we found that, you know, average compound is 100 houses. So average village is 100 houses, so we're not getting enough money in. So then we've had to expand it, so the village water person now has four villages under them. So then actually we're paying his wages, and we're getting in a quite nice pot of money so that we are able to do some repairs. But, you know, is it replicable? Is it sustainable long term? I mean, you know, I'm trying to do a different system because the community system isn't working. But we're still going in there with DFID money, 
and putting in six, seven thousand pounds worth of kit at the start of the um, process. So the depressing answer is probably more no than yes. There you go. Can I ask Nick to ask the as well before going to the question? The question was about system. Our groundwater resources to stay uh, affordable in the long term, and if so, who pays for them? I think if we look across the world, I think the way I look at things, I think in um, all, all parts of the world apart from Africa, there is huge potential and I think, for water sources and water services to be managed and paid for by the users of those services. Now, sometimes there are examples, for example, now of communities making investments in their own water supply in Latin America at the moment. And, and so I think there are um, ways and means, and the general economic outlook in some of those places means that there really is a potential for, for those services to be fully, fully priced, as it were. I think in Africa it is a completely different scenario, and I, I honestly don't, I don't have an answer in, in Africa. I think if we look in urban context, we're getting quite a lot of the way there to actually providing services which are, you know, I don't know really the, the, the underlying efficiencies of the utilities, but we're not that far away in some cases from having, having systems, depending on how you price the water in the first place, which are viable. But I do think in rural Africa, I think there are huge challenges, and I think the way in which subsidy in some form is provided there is the really important part of how we end up creating a viable system in the next 15 to 25 years. Thank you. <coughs> yes. I, I was just going to comment that uh, anybody in the West who buys a piece of equipment, like a motor car, <coughs> expects to spend money on maintenance. But somehow the donors and funders who are funding uh, boreholes and hand pumps in Africa don't want to put aside money for maintenance. And, uh, you know, frankly, if there isn't the money from the local community, then it's going to fail. It's going to fail within a period of five years or less. So, really, I think the funding needs to have a 10-year, approximately, allowance for maintenance at something of the order of 5 to 10% per annum of the original capital cost. And that's the borehole, the pump, and any other bits and pieces. I think it can become sustainable over time if um, some of the complexities are addressed because um, in Africa, for example, you don't have a pop manufacturing company, for example. So having things, technology to replace the replacement part becomes really expensive and extremely expensive to get a replacement part to fix a problem. So, if there are manufacturing plants in Africa for some of these things, for example, you can't find a brand new rig drilling a borehole in Africa because there's no rig manufacturing company there. So, it makes it really difficult and highly expensive. So, they only have fairly used ones which will break down before they complete the borehole project. So, which I know some of the reasons because of the complexity, unstable economy, unstable security for manufacturers carrying manufacturing plants to <coughs> that region. So those are some of the challenges. But over time, once that's addressed politically and economically, then manufacturers can move in there and the parts and the parts are cheaper to get. Okay. Uh, thank you, brother. Yeah. And you just pass it in front of you. Uh, <coughs> yes, I just wanted to come in on this issue of subsidies, which I think is a very, very important one in the longer run. A comment in relation to urban areas. I mean, obviously there, there's great scope for cross-subsidy. In other words, you know, charging an awful lot for major use and somehow getting it in the other, in, into the poorer use. And I think this has been very well done in places like Durban and one or two places around the world. But it falls down where there is open access to groundwater because the middle class and the upper classes are the people who, who use the groundwater uh, you know, in large amounts rather than paying for the water service. You know, they they self-supply and get out of it. So, but I think in general, in the urban area, you've got to look at the, the round, you've got to look at the, the utility supply and self-supply and the whole, the whole setup. In the rural areas, it surprises me that 
it seems from what you're saying that still we do not have enough pre-planning when we're going into areas and, and thought about the sort of cost. We, we, it sounds as if people think that the unit cost of provision from groundwater is going to be equal everywhere and it's almost logarithmic as somebody was saying here and until you recognize that and you're going to get in many areas situations where it simply isn't going to be you know, sustained and self-paying and you've got to look for other formulas and get a clearer picture there, I think you, know, you can't go forward. Now I'm not saying how much, it's just an impression I'm getting. So I think that maybe the biggest message I'm taking from here is that we need more hydrological thought at the planning stage when we embark on areas because we don't have it, we, get, we, don't, we haven't got this sort of economic framework behind us. So again, uh, it's, it's not a simple picture, you need to understand the systems and there's different solutions in different areas and, and in different institutions. I'm going to move on to the third question, which is to you, Kim, which is uh, today in a lot of the workshops and the discussions uh, in the talks, so there's a lot of discussion about the importance of local good hydrogeological data and information to drive down costs and in increase value and success. But where do we think this knowledge could actually be based, this knowledge and expertise within a country? Where can that actually be found or based? Well, I think the more people that have access, the better. And I think the days of having one library with one source are gone. And I do think the work Kirsten and yourself are doing on the Africa um, map, you know, the collection of the data, is going to be very useful. And then the work Durant's been doing on collecting the information from the different hydrogeologists. So when you need to know something, you say, well, who else is working in that area? And you get up-to-date information. So I think the World Wide Web is probably going to come into that. But how are you going to handle the big data question is something that most companies are battling with at the moment. Yeah. How are you actually going to handle that? But I do think the World Wide Web in itself is self-sustaining in that there's more people communicating and through HWD and through your Africa Atlas, I think it's going to be possible to say, where do we get that information? And there are pointers. You're never going to, have to, repla you're never going to replace research mm -hmm. into where the information is coming from. But I do think the Atlas is going to be a wonderful starting point. Thank you. It wasn't meant to be. A <laughs> 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 right, I, I just wanted to mention... Oh, perfect on, finish. Sorry. <laughs> on, on the African side... I do have a challenge coming to Europe because everyone talks about Africa as one country. Mm. Remember, there are 53 countries. Mm. There's a billion people there. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of people in, say, um, Abuja have more in common with people in Nairobi than they do with the village two, um, two kilometres down the road. So it, it's very important to realise that African problems can be very site-specific. And, of course, we do have the religious problems there as well, where, you know, who actually has access to water. So I, I'd really love you to take away from this forum is that please don't just lump Africa as one particular challenge. It's very site-specific. And when we talk about hydrogeologists investigating problems, as Richard said, it depends on the complexity where we've had good success throughout sub-Saharan Africa is to have hydrogeological technicians that are trained enough to spot when they don't know what they need to know and then can go back and through resources like HWB and, of course, the British Geological Survey and the other wonderful resources in Europe can be put in touch with the people who can support them. So it, it's not just where can the data be found, it's the network okay. that is so essential and the communication. And as mentioned earlier, I do find the internet is transforming, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, thanks. thanks for that, Kim. I, it's interesting that every question, the kind of complexity has come out that... Uh, Treating things almost individually and knowing how that uh, that uh, no places are exactly the same, but we have to have uh, specific solutions for specific issues. Richard, can you say anything about that kind of local data and local expertise as well, from all your experience and training that you've done over the years? I think I, I would certainly support what Kim's just said, um, very much so. I mean, more the more um, public access to information that there is, the better, and, and the technology that's developing is allowing that. Um, 
I think other than that, I would simply s sort of reiterate um, a couple of points that came up this morning about the, the local generation of, of knowledge and the importance of that. Um, you know, that it, for too long, the research agenda, I think, has been driven from outside of African countries. Um, and, and in future, I think it's got to be much more owned and, and funded from within. Um, so that the knowledge is generated and owned and stored and disseminated from within the country rather than through international agencies. Okay, thank you. I, I realise I've run over, uh, but I would like to put that over to out to the floor if anyone's got any comments they'd like to make. I've got three hands up already, but I'll have Clive right at the back, and then I'll come to you. Um, I'd just like to share some observations for working um, recently on the last couple of years on water governance projects along the, um, the Indian coastline, so from, from Kenya down to South Africa. And um, <clears throat> I was looking at an environmental flow which is in rivers, which is you know, a complex issue that can be dealt with at different levels of complexity. And what became apparent was that there was, a, there was an awful lot of capacity in the countries. Uh, and it is not necessarily appreciated that it's there. So there are universities, there are professionals, um, and there's a lot of knowledge transfer between the countries. And I think with the web especially becoming more uh, accessible, that will continue. So there are, there's a community of practice in between a lot of South African experts on ecological flow and going into the Zambezi and going into mm -hmm. to northern Tanzania. Okay, th thanks for that. Okay, we, we can pass forward now to the lady in the middle there. So again, lots of local networks and learning within countries and between countries is so important. Actually, I think Clive possibly answered my <laughs> question, which was, um, where do you see this knowledge coming from? Where's the training coming from? For, for example, for the hydrogeological technician that's in country, is it coming from universities, maybe from industry, like Western industry that are working in country or elsewhere? So, so an issue there over, over, over training and, and capacity, and there are a number of institutes kind of looking at master's courses and, and lower level kind of quite a lot of training. So very good question. Then, Peter. Um, thank you. Uh, there are initiatives, WSP has taken initiatives in several Asian countries to establish an open data platform and linked to a system called Open Street, open street Map where anybody can do this and they've got government sort of secretaries of ministries who've instructed some departments to post their data on that. That's one of the approaches which you, as you were I mean, implying, the, the net, the, the web being the source. Second part, to make, make that usable, there have been initiatives, I don't know if anybody took part in them last year or this year, they were, they're called, last year there was a sanitation, international sanitation hackathon. There was a water hackathon in February this year when teams of development, developers come together, and you can use that, up, that type of situation to make those sort of almost randomly posted data sets accessible by inviting the challenge for people to develop tools to put them to practical application. That's a very good point, how, how technology is move, moving on so fast that there's now opportunities to, to sort of gather data in sort of new ways. A uh, point that Kim had made too about access to the web. Okay, going over a little bit, there's this one very final question I'd like to ask each member of the panel, and it needs to be snappy sound bite. And that is uh, what we should really go away with here as a group. Uh, what would be your one way to improve the kind of pathways for getting good groundwater expertise and knowledge into WASH programs? So if there's one thing that you could do would want to happen to get good groundwater expertise into WASH, what would it be? And it would need to be a very snappy sound bite. I'll start. I'll start. Yes, I'm looking at you now. I'll start. Can I start? You can start. <laughs> <laughs> Please um, do. I would say, and it's picked up by what many people have said during today, is that hydrogeology is important, but the, the more you can place that within the broader context, the better will be taken on board and will actually be used. And the simpler you can make those messages, the better also. Thank you. All right, Paul? I think NGOs involved in providing water for rural communities 
uh, to address issues of poverty. We must recognize that the hydrology has a key role to play in ensuring that they can provide safe and sustainable water supply systems. And those who manage the program must take time to, to recognize the value of hydrogeology and tap into both local and external expertise to improve the quality of their delivery. So we've got from Nick, improving the hydrogeological message to be simple. We've got donors and NGOs recognizing that hydrogeology is important. Kim? I think make it sexy, put it on YouTube. <laughs> every, every water borehole, <laughs> film it, put it on YouTube and connect it to HWB. Yeah. Right, okay, <laughs> great one from Kim. <laughs> Richard? Copy that I think for both hydrogeologists and for WASH specialists, I would say broaden your mind and never stop learning. Um, however focused your initial training is, you need to know about institutions and economics and social issues in communities and all the rest of it, as well as your scientific speciality, if that's what you start with. Um, I'm struck by the, uh, the contrast between the way hydrogeologists are trained and the way engineers are trained in, in a professional uh, manner. Um, hydrogeologists, I think, are quite narrow in focus compared to engineers. And maybe we need to think of ourselves... Controversial. Uh, <laughs> maybe we need to think of ourselves as having a much broader remit in society. Okay. Great. I've got to follow all that. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with them. No, I, mean, I think that was sort of, I was going to say something quite similar. I sort of wrote a little thing about, you know, I've learned because I don't know much about hydrology. So for me personally, you know, I, I, what I would go out of this is clearly more understanding. I mean, we were in Nigeria in 99 together and there's always going on about sediments and all these weird rocks and stuff. And for me, it's, it isn't very sexy. It's quite... You, sorry, it's, <laughs> because it's a bit boring. It's all rocks. You know, that's the sort of perception. So you need to make yourselves accessible, mm. so that someone who's running a little, you know, a business, or someone maybe you know one day goes to Diffid, or we're all going to be all over. I want to know who I can phone up and say, I need some help. Can you help me? And so it is about this completely using the internet and becoming huge open sharing of data because that's what we really need. And, and I think um, it's clearly moving in that direction. And I think your point is also valid that I do feel that you guys and girls need to sorry, embrace other, other sort of look at other options, you know, consider anything that's above ground. If I'm just, you know, sort of, I'm a, if I, can I say that? <laughs> Sounds of a rules, doesn't it? No, okay, I think you've said it. I've said it off. So we've, we've got well, keep the message simple. Cold. We've got donors and NGOs to educate themselves a bit about groundwater. We've got make it sexy. We've got broaden your mind and it's make hydrogeologists accessible to everybody else in the community. So I think give a round of applause, I think, for our panel has been very good. I'm, I'm sorry we did overrun after me promising to finish like quarter past. That's completely my fault. I don't know, Gernot, are you wanting to say some final words? Well, okay, I'll do it on your behalf. Thank you all so much. It's been an absolutely wonderful day and you've all contributed beautifully. So thank you so much. And on behalf of Hydrogeologists Without Borders and IAH and the Geological Society of London, I'd just like to thank you again so much for your participation today. Thank you very much.